Welcome again, everyone, to Microvellum's 15-6 live preview. We have our development team and several technicians standing by to help out with the questions that you have during our session. I just want to let you know that you can watch this webinar here through the Zoom interface, or you can go over to youtube.com, find our Microvellum channel, and we're streaming live there as well. If you have any questions for us, you can type them directly into the Q&A here in the Zoom interface or on the chat if you're there on YouTube. If you like something that you see or something, a uh, module that uh, is really, that gets you really looking forward to it, give us a shout out there in the chat. Let us know what you think. If you really like something, if you're excited about using it, uh, we look forward to seeing you there. So in the meantime, I'd like to turn our attention over to David Fairbanks. We're going to hear some words from him. He's our fearless leader working hard to keep all of us focused on helping you, our end users out. So please give him your attention. Thank you very much. Welcome everybody. I'm really excited about this. Our 15-6 debut is our latest. Um, everybody's been telling me this is the best, most tested, best performing release yet. I want to thank the development team, the advisory board, all the users that have contributed to this. Uh, we're super excited about it. We continue to innovate uh, with the confidence of the influence of our tribe. And those events um, that really help us are our TechCon event, which is a yearly event that we have in May. We just came off of that this year and uh, it was a success. And we're looking forward to those innovations getting layered in. Um, as uh, the time goes on here, we get webinars like uh, our live events. We get a lot of feedback from those, as well as direct input from you all um, and the, the input from our forums, uh, support, um, direct conversations. And then and a special thanks to our uh, user advisory board and the user group themselves. Uh, again, great con contribution. And really, our, our brand is becoming more about the tribe. And uh, we thank you all for being here today. Um, I thank you all very much, and you know we're we're a company of team players. You know we're all very humble, hungry, and smart individuals that love to solve problems. And that actually was uh, one of the biggest things that inspired me to um, acquire Microvellum about a year ago. And um, plus, I love software. I always have. I love uh, what it can do for for business and the timing just with a founder looking for a successor just was great. So I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about our, this release and how our year is going. Um, and we all understand that you all want to accumulate uh, more efficiencies to help you grow. And it's difficult because you wonder if you can be as efficient as you want to be. You feel constrained maybe about not being able to bid some things. Um, you feel limited and, unable to do some of the things you wish that you could do. And so Microvellum, you know, we create software that's influenced by each of you on this call to help streamline the way you design your product, to engineer how you get those out into production. Um, and that allows you to confidently grow your business. You know, every day, thousands of woodworkers automate their processes with our software. And want to thank you for the opportunity today to show you how you too can enjoy what they are experiencing. And so, as uh, as we head into the second half of 2018, I want to charge you to start with the latest version of Microvellum. You know, really don't wait any longer. You're you're wasting time if you haven't upgraded um, to the latest releases. We've got some functionality in there if you're on an older version that you can really take advantage of. And staying current is, a, is definitely a virtue. Um, in the United States, we are absolutely poised for growth. And I, I encourage you to not be left behind. You know, make sure you're focusing on your technology and, and thinking of yourself as a technology company rather than a woodwork, work, woodworking company that uses technology. So streamline the way you work. Stay connected with the tribe, collaborating with our user group, and think of yourself as being an active and participant with our tribe. Um, influence us with TechCon, with our live events, attend a regional training event, contribute, 
on a forum or in person. Stay engaged. Also, think about intentionally improving the technology that you use as a driver for your growth in your business. So be a growing company. Um, collaborate with your suppliers and your employees. Uh, value teamwork and stay accountable. Don't be afraid to invest in technology to gain those improvements that you're looking for. So we have a really nice presentation today to demonstrate a lot of the innovations that we've, uh, we've been able, been influenced by all of you to implement in this software. And I'm, I'm so excited to, to uh, hand this off to the development team. All right, well with that in mind, what I want to do is let you all know about this uh, 15.6 version that we're talking about a little bit by the numbers. So since the last general release that we put out, we have over 1,000 improvements actually logged, made to the software that you're going to get the benefit of. And to break that down even a little bit more, 100 of those are new features. 70 of those are requests coming from TechCon last year, 2017, and this year, 2018, that we've been able to implement from users like you. Now, I said there are 100, feature, 100 new features, at least. We're not going to be able to go into detail on all of them. We're not even going to be able to show you all of them, but we wanted to highlight some of the major new aspects of the software that will help you every day. We're really excited about it. This is the chance that we have to show you the fruits of our labor for 12 months or more. And we hope that you as an end user will be able to see how these features are gonna benefit you on a daily basis and be able to help you streamline the way you work. So to begin with, I'd like to give our attention to one of our developers, Lucas. He has some cool new stuff to show us with the Processing Center interface. And then maybe you've heard of the uni Unified Work Order database structure. He's going to break that down for us as well. Lucas, are you there? Yes, thank you. Uh, so as Dominic said, we're going to be talking about the Unified Work Order database and some changes we've done to the Processing Center. So I wanted to start off here with the Unified Work Order database um, and just talk about some of the changes. Um, prior to 15.6, the, the work orders were driven by individual work order databases that existed inside of a folder for each individual work order. What the unified work order database is going to do is bring all of those work orders into one single database that can then live on an SQL server. Um, <clears throat> this is going to be an opt-in type of framework, so you don't have to transition over to it, uh, but there are a few business drivers that I wanted to mention that would, um, that are things you want to think about as you begin transitioning over to the unified work order database. So a few of the business drivers that are out there are the increased agility. Um, and what I mean by increased agility is just giving your IT departments, um, as well as Microvellum, um, <clears throat> the ability to react quicker to issues that might come up. In terms of an IT department, um, if you have a unified work order database and it's living on an SQL server, which is shared with maybe your Microvellum factory database, uh, simplifies the processes of creating backups and restoring databases um, and just gives the IT department a quicker reaction time to issues that might come up. The second business driver is a reduction in complexity. Um, having individual databases live inside of a folder structure on a file server uh, just increases the complexity that's there and it can change based on who set it up, when it was set up, uh, and the mood that the person might have been in when they set it up. The third business driver behind it is higher service levels. Um, and what I mean by higher service levels is kind of related to the agility idea where it's gonna help to improve the service that you're receiving from your IT department and from Microm as well. Um, if you have a unified work order database and it's on an SQL server, it's kind of the standard method of doing it and it's going to match what's on there for the Microm factory. Uh, this is going to give you higher service levels because then your IT has a standardized method of managing those databases. And you'll also get a better service level from Microvellum because if you do come with an issue, uh, the support techs are going to know right away how your setup is, is configured uh, because it'll be standard across several companies. Uh, the final uh, business driver behind the Unified Work Order database is the increased reporting opportunities or increased reporting capabilities. Um, these are ones, these are, this is a business driver that you're going to see immediately inside of your reports. Um, 
up till now, the reports you've been able to build for manufacturing data have been specific to the work order that you're currently loaded into. With the unified work order database, all that data that exists is gonna be in a single database, which means you'll be able to access all of that data simultaneously. So you'll be able to build factory type reports that will be able to access all your information and help you make business decisions to help grow your business. Uh, so I just wanted to briefly go over those um, and share those with you. The second thing that I'm gonna be sharing here is some changes that we've done to the processing center um, that'll help streamline the way you work and make decisions a lot easier. So I'm just gonna load into one of our work orders here that I have. And as we load into the data, uh, we're gonna notice that the, the processing center looks you know, almost the same, but there are additional functionalities that I really like and that the development team has worked hard to implement. Um, if you're familiar with the processing station grid in 15.5, the data that came in was pretty much static in there. You could do some things such as sorting by the different columns that are in there, allowing you to you know, give some organization to your data that's here. Um, with this new grid, what we've also allowed you to do is to be able to utilize some of the column headers to format your data in a way that actually makes it a lot more usable as well. So for example, I have 624 parts in this work order. Um, one of the simple things here, if I select parts, I'll be able to see in that upper right hand corner the number of parts that I have selected. Um, one of my favorite things on here is the new grouping that we have enabled in this grid. So at the top you'll see it says drag column headers here to create groups. So to simply do that, you just click on the header that you wanna group by. So here I'm gonna do specification groups and drag it up. And what you'll notice is that this now creates subgroups in here to easily see the data that exists. So we know that everything inside of this HPDL group is the specification HPDL. And you can do this with as many columns as you like. So if I do materials, it'll group my spec groups. And then within my spec group group, I will have it grouped by the materials. So now I know that all these parts, these four parts that I have are that 0.25 white melamine HPDL spec group. Another feature that we've added into here is the ability to filter dynamically um, in the grid. So for example, with the part names and any of the columns really here, you'll notice that on the right hand side of the column, there's a little black arrow for a drop down menu. When you select that, you're gonna get a list of items that are in that specific column. So here I can see all of the different parts that I have in this column. If I wanted to view just a specific part, I could maybe only see my adjustable shelves, apply that filter, and then my adjustable shelves will be the only thing that shows up in this grid. It allows you to quickly filter and group different information so that way you can very easily assign processing stations and get your uh, design information out to the shop to be produced. Um, along with those filters are some other basic text filters. So we can do something with a uh, contains and specify something. Maybe we only want to see parts that contain the word base in them. And so then every part that has base in that name will show up and everything else will be excluded. So those are a couple of the grid enhancements that I wanted to share with you here. A few other minor enhancements that we've done to this uh, to the processing center is with our processing station grid here at the bottom. Um, we have some new buttons here and it used to be that in order to do anything to these processing stations, you'd have to select it and then go find the button you want and press it. Now, if you want to modify the processing station, you can just simply double click on it and it'll launch and let you change any settings that you might need to change. Now, one of my favorite features of this that I find most usable, um, and I think that you all agree is very uh, handy, is the ability to actually save your, gri your grid view. So if this is a grid view that I decide that is how I wanna see my data every time I load into a work order, I can come into my grid settings and I can actually set this as a default view and save it. So I'm gonna save this one here and we'll just call this a spec group by material, Oop, by material. And I'm gonna save this grid in here. You can save multiple different grid views. So here we have a system default. We have one that's a system default modified, which, um, just shows that I changed, made changes but weren't saved, and then I have the one that I saved. So you can have multiples in here as well. You can also determine which columns you actually want to show up versus which ones you don't want to show up. So by saving this, every time I load into a work order, those grid settings will be applied. So I'll just load into another work order here, and I'm gonna select work order one, which was not the one we were just in. And when it loads all the parts, it's gonna apply that grouping to it automatically, and then quickly and easily allow you to assign processing stations and send them out to the shop to get work done. So I hope you all enjoy that, uh, the new processing station grid and give us your feedback on how you're using it. All right, cool, Lucas, thank you for showing us that. We can see how uh, sometimes we just have data overload. We've got so much and it's difficult for us to process what's going on mentally. This will really help 
with that. We appreciate you showing us those things. Uh, next, we're going to talk to Daniel. He's going to talk to us about a new framework that has been implemented into Microvellum software, version 15.6 and greater. Daniel, are you there? Yeah, I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, let me uh, share my screen here. So <clears throat> today I'm going to be showing everybody a new framework that has been developed and this is actually allowing us to add several new types of features into the software um, that will help with software events and user activity. Uh, to start off, let's start off by showing the user activity tracking. Now, this isn't as ominous as it sounds. Um, and has actually been highly requested by companies so they can have some accountability within their organization when it comes to modifying uh, files made to specific uh, files throughout the program. Um, in order to show this, let's go ahead and open up the project specification groups. So I'll go to my toolbox setup here and my project specification groups. Now, and uh, we'll start out by just going and open up our global file. Now, previously, if any changes were made to this file, it was really up to the user uh, to communicate that to their team. Um, and sometimes months can go by and you don't really remember what changes or what has happened inside of a spec group. So let's go ahead and just make a change here and uh, we will just modify one of these globals and we'll save it and hit OK. So we know that that global's been changed and modified. Um, while we're in here, let's also create a new component file. So we'll go ahead and just make a new hardware file here. All right, so we've made some modifications to our specification group and what's actually been happening behind the scenes is that we've been adding activity logs um, throughout the, uh, every time it's been saved or modified, and um, we can view these activity logs through our new um, event log interface here. So in order to access that, we'll go to our uh, view event log. And um, this will show us all of the events that have occurred in the software. Um, the first thing you'll notice about this interface is that it's using the same grid that Lucas was just showing us here in the center. So all of the cool features that he showed with grouping and filtering and sorting um, are also available while viewing your event logs. Across the left side of the screen, we have the ability to um, filter out what um, events you want to see. So if you are looking for a specific type of event, once you become more familiar with them, you'll be able to use the filters here on the left side to really dial in and find specific um, items that you're looking for. Um, each row shown is a different event. So let's go ahead and just take a look at these. You can see that uh, we can um, see the date and time that the event occurred. Uh, we have a message, so if we make this a little bit bigger, we can see that a project level global was modified um, and also a new project level um, hardware file was created. We can see the user that uh, made that modification and the machine that they were on. And if we scroll over to the right, we can even see the file name here along with the project that it was, um, the modification was made in. So all of these um, activity tracking logs have been sprinkled throughout the program. So you can expect to see them, uh, as I mentioned, when we're working with specification groups. So if specification groups get edited or um, modified, um, if and you're in a new project and new specification groups get created, you'll also see logs for those. Um, we've added a lot for when we're working at the template level. So if a file gets overwritten or changed, you'll get notification that the template level information has been modified. Um, we've also added logs for the library. So if a library product gets added or gets um, overwritten, you'll have a log for that. Um, same thing for the subassembly. So if a new subassembly gets mod or changed or modified, you'll see a log for that as well. And also if a project or location is deleted. So we begin sprinkling these throughout the software. And um, if you would like more um, of these activity logs sprinkled throughout that you don't see that you would like to um, see inside your events log here, you can contact us and we'll begin adding more throughout the future releases of 15.6. So hopefully with these changes being logged, you'll have better accountability within your organization or at least have a, uh, a trail as to what has happened inside of a project. One last note on this, as I'm sure the questions are pouring in after showing the global file being changed, um, does the record actually show which globals were changed? And unfortunately, as of right now, it doesn't, but we are looking at the ability to pass in the specific globals that were changed for that record so you have an even more detailed view as to what was changed inside of each file. So let's look at the other portion of this new framework, which is our event logging portion. So when we talk about um, 
events, what we really are talking about are dialogues or message boxes where the software is giving you information or is requesting information in order to proceed. Uh, to show you how this new framework handles these types of events, let's look at a situation that I'm sure a few people have run into. You're getting ready to leave for lunch and you have a large work order that you want to process. So before leaving, you go ahead and start the work order and then you take off and um, are waiting for it to get done by the time you get back. Well, you get back and you realize that only a few products have been processed and you have a message box that's popped up that stalled the entire process. <clears throat> and so instead of moving on with the rest of the tasks that you have for the day, um, you have to hit the OK button and then you can go ahead and continue on with um, or then the computer can continue on processing the rest of that work order. So to demonstrate the new event logs, let's recreate that situation. So I have a uh, part here, and we're gonna go ahead and create a work order for this. And I have modified the material name so it will produce an error for us while we are creating the work order. So we'll go ahead and process this. And I forgot to uh, turn off some of my settings from the previous demonstration. So just uh, close your eyes and you didn't see any of that. Let's start this again. So uh, we will go ahead and process this, uh, process the uh, part here. And there's our message box. So <clears throat> before, um, it's the uh, entire work order creation process has stopped. And until we hit the OK button, it's not going to continue on. But you'll notice now that um, this message box has the ability to be hidden. So what we can do is um, by checking this, it's going to suppress that message box um, forever. So let's go ahead and check that option and we'll hit okay. And when the work order is finished, we will see another message box, this time asking us if we want to open up the uh, work order. Um, in this case, it has the same um, option here. So we have the ability to say, don't show this again. So every single message box throughout the entire program now has the ability to be hidden. Um, in addition to every message box being hidden, it also has the ability to remember the selection that you made. So in this case, it's saying yes or no, if you wanna be able to open this work order or not. Well, if we select do not show this again and click yes, it's going to remember that selection. So every work order that we create in the future will automatically open up in the processing center. So now that we have those uh, new options checked, let's go ahead and just process one more time and you'll see that instead of the um, instead of the work order creation process stopping, it's gonna go ahead and um, suppress those message boxes and finish up and you'll also see the work order automatically open here. So we haven't fixed up the product or anything. We still have those errors, but what we've done is we have pushed them to our event log um, interface. So we'll go back to our event, um, we'll view our event log, and you'll see here that now we have a few more messages in here. So here are the um, new messages that have been created, and we can see that the material still couldn't be found, um, and we also have the uh, work order that's been processed. So instead of the user having to um, select the specific answer that they want for those message boxes, it's already been um, selected and suppressed, and then the events have been pushed to this interface here. So depending on your personal experience and level of comfort with Toolbox, you have the ability to begin suppressing any unwanted message boxes that you don't want, and then just keep an eye on your event log as to see what's happening within the software. Now you may be asking, what if I want my message boxes back? Well, we have the ability to bring that message box back and we can manage all the message boxes by going into our options page here and we have this edit hidden message box. So this will show us a list of all of the message boxes that we've suppressed and here's our part missing material. And so if we want to bring that um, message box back, we can go ahead and turn that off. Um, we also have the ability to change the default option for uh, message boxes that have multiple answers. So here is the work order selection if we wanna open it and we can change our default answer to a no instead of yes, or we can also uncheck this to display that message box again. So overall, we're very excited for this new event logging framework. Uh, we hope that with the ability to suppress these message boxes, um, users won't have to stand by their computer waiting for these processing tasks to finish. And with the user activity tracking, it will provide more insight into your day-to-day -day work. All right, cool, Daniel. We can see how these things would be especially useful for people in management positions or that work with a large engineering team, being able to coordinate efforts and know what changed when, maybe for troubleshooting purposes or if they want to take things back a step. So we can see uh, how 
and why this was a popular request and how it's going to be useful to others. So I appreciate that. Next, we're going to give our attention to Doug, another one of our developers. He's going to talk to us about some new Nest tabbing capabilities that are now available in 15.6. Doug, are you there? I am here. Thank you, Dominic, and good evening or good morning, depending on where you're located on the planet. We are going to show you some great new functionality that's likely to save you a lot of time, and you'll see why as we go down through this segment. And it has to do with Nest tabbing. So what are Nest tabs? Some of you have probably had a lot of experience with these. Others maybe have no idea what they are. But basically, a tab is a small bridge of material that's left remaining during the primary machining operation of a Nest. So here, if you look on the screen, you'll see a, a graphic of, of what that is. So the, the tool travels along here in a horizontal direction. It hits the tab definition and ramps up to a specified height and then ramps back down to the full material depth. So the purpose of that then is that it creates a one piece framework between the various different parts and that immobilizes the parts so they don't move around. And then later in a secondary operations, the machine tool can come back and route that tab out or it can be manually removed if that's how you wanna do it. But Tabs are helpful because often small parts don't contain enough surface area to properly act with a machine vacuum system. And because of that, nests with many small parts, may you may experience wandering of the parts or wandering of the machining. It, it may look like a drunken router bit has, has been applied to your parts because it wanders just a little bit now that's not too bad. You may have to re, remake the part. The other option that can happen is that the router bit catches the part, flings it up, flings it across the shop at 100 miles per hour. So that's not a very good thing unless you're wearing full body armor. So what is the same in this release then is that you can still add nest tabs manually. So the manual method is still available using 2D machining tools. What's different is that where previously manual tabbing was the only option, now you have the option to use automatic tabbing. So that's available with standard, center line, and stay down nesting types. And those tabs, as the name implies, are applied automatically. So let's go over to our toolbox here. And let me show you some of the significant processing station properties that are necessary. So here I have three products, three suspended drawer base cabinets or suspended drawer cabinets. And I've created a work order. I'll go into that work order in my processing center. And from the processing center, you'll need to go into the properties of the processing station. So I click on my IPP sample nest and I can either click the edit button or just double click on, the, on that selection there. And this processing station box comes up, click the nest tab. And there are three areas of properties here that we would like to, to talk about just briefly. So the first is the border method. So like I talked about, um, you can apply auto tabs to the standard type border method the center or common line and the stay down. So that's where you select which of those three that you'd like to use. The second area is the small part handling area and we'll focus on the lower half of this section, the tabs part. So remember we talked before how the, the tabs are actually little pyramids if you remember that picture. So if you think about it as a pyramid, then the base of the pyramid is tab length one, the bottom. Tab length two here is the top of the pyramid. If you were to measure across of it, cross it. And of course the tab height is how high that tab is. Has to be less than the material height, obviously. So those are important properties of, of tabs. The other here is the auto placement quantity. So you might think of this as the type of tabbing strategy that's applied to your nest. So if your vacuum system is pretty good, you don't have a lot of small parts on your nest, 
maybe you'll decide just to pick one from this list. That's, that's fine. In this case, we're, we've picked a value of four just to demonstrate also because we have nests with a lot of small parts on them. The third area is the small part threshold. So here on the right side. So a small part is defined by these two properties. The first is a part will be defined as small part if the length or the width is below the value set here. So the value I've got set is four and one eighth inch. Uh, you could enter the corresponding value. Um, the area is set to 140 square inches. So if either of those properties apply to a, any single part, it's defined as a small part and the tabs are added to it. So those are the, the pertinent qualities there, or properties rather that apply. And then just before we go on, I'd like to give you a higher level overview of the auto tabbing. So generally, the first thing you do would be to set those properties. The second thing to do would be to process the work order here in the processing center. And then the third way, the third thing that you would do is to view the nests to see if they're what you, what you needed or if they need any modification. So by showing you this, we're going to say that we've processed this job. And now we'll do the third step. We'll view them. And you would go to nest tabs, open drawing. And I do already have the drawings open. So we'll flip over to those drawings. So the first nest I have here was created with a standard method. If we zoom into this, you'll see that I have a, a material sheet here that has some parts that are not small parts according to the definition, the size we entered, and then some parts that are and that thus include tabs. So that becomes apparent why the, that small part threshold is necessary. If we scroll to the right here, here's a nest with everything containing tabs. So everything falls under that threshold. And then here's one with no, none of the parts. So you'll see that it applies that um, to create these auto tabbing. And you'll notice that I didn't add any tabs manually here. And I didn't before this presentation. So can you imagine, just look at this sheet, look at all the parts that have tabs applied. Now, if you had to add these tabs manually, let's say it was a large project with 80 to 100 sheets, can you imagine the time that would take? So. That's, that's not what we want you to do, is spend your time adding tab definitions. So it's one of the reasons we, we've we um, created this auto tabbing functionality. Now the next tabbing method is stay down. So some of you are familiar with this type. Once the router bit drops into the material, the goal is to keep that in the material without having to raise it out and do any rapid uh, rapid distance changes to a new point, new set point. So almost one long router path here. But the point is though that tabs were added in this environment also. And if we scroll through these, you'll see the same thing is, is happening. Some of the sheets do, some of the sheets don't. So that is stay down nesting. The third type then is centerline nesting. And the same thing is true. So those of you familiar with centerline, it means that the router bit drops. And in one machining operation, one pass, it routes the borders of two different parts. So that's what's happening here. But again, a tab is entered according to our, op or our, our strategy applied for tabs in many cases when that, can, when that works. And let me use this drawing to show you something else that although these auto tabs have been placed and it saved a lot of time, maybe this is not how you want it. We wanna give you the ability to, to modify this uh, in any way that you want. So the first way is by using the 2D machining tools and adding a tab, but that's not really necessary because you can use these, these existing tabs, you can delete them so if you want to delete one of these tabs because they're not necessary, that's fine. It's just an AutoCAD block definition. You can copy the tab, use the AutoCAD copy command. 
and make a copy of one of those and place it somewhere else on your on your nest or you can simply use the AutoCAD move command and move that block definition to a different place. So you see that with those three AutoCAD commands and the accompanying tab block definitions, you can completely customize this to any way that you want. So manual tab placement is still available, but we think that this auto tab placement will give you what you need in a fraction of the time. In fact, we think it will help you streamline your nesting process and save you time. So back to you, Dominic. All right, appreciate it, Doug. We can see that's gonna be a big time saver for our nest users out there, and it's no longer restricted to center line, so everybody can take advantage of that. We appreciate it. Next, Andrew was gonna to talk to us about some new model documentation tools available with OEM 2019, some changes to library designer, as well as a new configuration manager that's coming with version 15.6. Andrew, are you there? I sure am, Dominic, thank you so much. Yeah, so the first feature that I'm gonna talk about is a new feature that was included in Toolbox OEM 2019. And the command is called ViewBase. And this command simplifies the process of generating 2D views from a 3D model. And so for those of you who are using OEM that need to create 2D views and documentation for reception desks, store fixtures, or any sort of custom product, generating 2D views just got a whole lot quicker and easier. And so let's go ahead and do a quick demonstration. So here I have created a simple die wall using our solid modeling tools. And I'm gonna go ahead and activate the view base command by just typing view base. And here I'm gonna go ahead and select my model that I'm working with. Just highlight the entire thing and hit enter. And now it's gonna ask us if we wanna create a new layout or use an existing one. And so I already have this 17 by 22 um, layout. So I'm gonna go ahead and just use that one by typing enter. And that's gonna bring us right into this layout space. And so now we can posi position our first uh, front view that we want to include. And so here, if we just left click on our page, we're gonna get several options that allow us to change how the hidden line type is displayed and other visibility options. So here, if we go into hidden lines, um, let's go ahead and just keep it on visible and hidden. And let's go ahead and hit enter. And this will allow us to now place our other views. And you can see as I move my cursor, it's going to automatically determine what view to display. And so here, if we move it straight up, we can go and place our top view. Over here diagonally, we can place a perspective view. And straight across is a side view. And then when we're finished, we can go ahead and just type enter on the command line. And that's going to render out our views as we've specified. Now, this command is um, meant to be used with other uh, view commands. And so if we use the view detail command, this will allow us to select one of our views to create a detail annotation. So here, if we just select right there, we can create just a small section that we can use as a detail. And here, I'll go ahead and just hit enter for that. And so that's gonna create that one detail. Another command that we can use with this is called the view section. And here I'll go and select my front view. And I'm just gonna create a section through this straight segment of my die wall here. And I'll hit enter and we'll go ahead and just drop that one section right next to it. And so you can see that having this command is definitely a time saver when it comes to creating the different views, especially when this is coupled with the other annotation and dimensioning features that AutoCAD offers. And so with this being a standard AutoCAD command, there's already a lot of documentation available on how this works. And those of you who have been using the standard version of AutoCAD probably already are familiar with this and may use it on a regular basis. But for those of you using OEM versions, this is definitely gonna be a helpful feature for you. So the next topic that I want to talk about relates to the library designer tool. And this has been around for many years, uh, but, for, but for those of you who aren't familiar, it can be accessed by selecting the tool setup and library designer. 
And this tool allows you to view your library in many different ways. And so here we can see a standard categorized list of all of our categories and products that we have in there. We can also see the common parts that it found throughout our library and also the common prompts. Now, these views allow data developers to quickly make mass edits to their library. And this is something that our internal data developers use on a daily basis. And I've been teamed up with them to ensure that every aspect of this tool is not only working as intended, but is optimized to be as quick and as simple to use as possible. And after spending several months working with the data development team, we were able to resolve dozens of stability issues and make many improvements to how these tools function. So for those of you who maintain or create library data and have ran into maybe inconsistent results with Library Designer in the past, I encourage you to revisit this tool. With this new release, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised with how it works just the way that you would expect it to work. Um, and for those of you who are interested, a complete list of all of the fixes and improvements that have been made are available in the release notes for this version. And the final topic that I'm going to be discussing is a new interface that was included in this release to help you manage your configurations and preferences. And in order to access it, I'm going to bring up the splash screen here real quick. And the interface is accessed by clicking this ellipse button right here. So if we click on that, you can see that the interface is separated into two tabs. We have a list of all of our current configurations and a list of our current preferences. If you're not familiar, the configurations will typically store the information related to where your library is located and the preferences store all the different settings that are available in the options page. So one of the improvements that this interface provides is a streamlined way to migrate information to newer view versions. And so if you're going to be upgrading to the 2019 OEM and you want to pull all of your preferences and configuration options from that version, you can just come here and select this plus button. And you can see that's going to browse your computer for every microvellum related product that you have along with the different configurations that are available in there. And so all you do is just select the configuration you want to migrate to the current version and click OK and that's going to create a new configuration for you. Now the same functionality works with the preferences so if you have different options that you wanted to use you can go ahead and add those as well and bring those preferences across to the new version that you're working with. And another scenario that's something that's probably a bit more common is the process of setting up new workstations. So let's say that you hire a new employee or purchase a new computer and you have installed the software already and now you just want to make sure that this station functions in the exact same way as all of your other machines. It could be a little bit difficult to go through all of the options from one computer to another to make sure that everything is set up in an identical way between multiple machines. And so now we have the ability to export and import the different options and so or the different configurations and preferences. And so all that needs to be done is you click the export button. That's going to allow you to uh, browse to a location on either your network um, and export this MVG file. And then that could again either be uploaded to a network or into a thumb drive and you can then browse to the computer or open up the computer and then import those settings. We also have the ability here to delete and rename configurations. That's been a commonly requested feature. And so now with this possible, or now with this interface, we have a lot more options when it comes to managing your current configurations and your preferences. And so that's everything that I have to show today. And so I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to you, Dominic. All right, cool. Thanks for showing us those new features. Andrew, we can see that the uh, new model documentation is going to be very useful for people who have to communicate changes out to the shop floor, as well as the library designer for people that are maintaining uh, data libraries. So we're excited for people to be able to use those. Now we're going to give our attention to Daniel again. He has some cool stuff to show us with drafting improvements, some new tokens, and how to edit multiple products in a drawing at once. All and right. Can you hear me all right, Dominic, again? We can. Awesome. 
Yeah, so um, I know we've shown everybody a lot of stuff so far, and I've got a handful of things to show um, to show off here. So let's go ahead and start off with uh, some improvements that we have made to our flat shot token. Now, very similar to what AutoCAD has done with the view base, we have created a flat shot token. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the flat shot token, what this is is a single um, token that you can add to any library product. This isn't library specific, so um, as long as you're running um, 15.6, you'll be able to have access to this token. And so you can add it to a product and it has several different options, um, such as the view that you want um, and if you want to show machining. Um, and so what you can do is you add this and it will automatically generate a 2D um, representation of that, um, of that product. Um, to show you this, what we'll do is I just have a one door base and this is just drawn in 3D here so you can see that. And so what we'll do is uh, we go, we'll go to our uh, 2D drawings section and we have our draw dynamic product image. So we'll go ahead and select this and select our um, product. And then we'll just pick a point where we want to draw our flat shot. So um, the first improvement that we've made for 15.6 with the flat shot is the speed. For those of you that have used it in the past, um, you'll notice right there, it's much, much faster than it has been previously. Um, and so just taking a look at our flat shot, you can see we have five different views here. So we have our front, top, a 3D view, a side view, and we also have an exploded view. So these are some of the options that are available within the flat shot token. Um, also new to 15.6 is we've added the option to show hardware. So you'll see here that right now I don't have any of my hardware showing. Um, what we can do to show hardware is we've added another parameter to our flat shot. So um, in order to show this, I'll go ahead and open up the spreadsheet and I'm going to go to where my flat shot tokens are located. So we can see here that I have a few different flat shot tokens and parameter two is the options. This is where you can do that exploded view, what machining um, options you want to see. So um, the fifth option that we have added is the show hardware. So if this is set to a value of one, it's going to go ahead and generate the hardware for each, uh, for whatever view you have it displayed on. So we'll go ahead and do that and we will save and close this. And then we will go ahead and just redraw my product and it will see that there were changes made to my flat shot and update my views here. Um, one thing to note with the um, hardware turned on is you will notice a slight time increase. Um, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes of actually getting that DWG, um, finding out what that hardware is um, and creating a 2D view of that. So uh, we have, uh, you will notice a little bit of uh, time increase there, but once it is finished, um, if we zoom back in, you'll see that uh, we have a nice representation of our hardware now. Um, another benefit to using the Flatshot token is that not only can you draw these Flatshot images um, in the AutoCAD environment, but if you go and process, if we go create a work order, you also have the option to add these images to your database. So we can go ahead and check that process Flatshot tokens, and this will add those images to the database, and then you can use those images on reports. Um, so any report that you create, if you want to create an assembly report for you guys out on the shop floor, um, the flat shot token will automatically create those and put those into the work order database for you. All right, so um, moving on, uh, let's now take a look at some of the 2D drafting improvements that uh, we have made for 15.6. Um, we have a lot of different ways that people like to draw their, uh, their AutoCAD environments. Uh, some, like I've done here, will draw in 3D. Um, I've added some plan tokens automatically um, as an option. Um, some people like to draw just the 2D plan views. Some like to do the 2D with the elevation right on top. So there's a lot of different ways that um, you can um, draw your products while you're creating your designs here. And uh, we've added another option to that. Um, just like you can um, create a 2D wall elevation of um, a wall, we now have the ability to draw a plan view of uh, several different walls. So to demonstrate this, um, we'll go to our 2D drawings and we'll select our draw 2D plan view. And then we'll just select our uh, walls that we want to generate a plan view for. So what this is gonna do is this is going to allow us to generate a separate 2D view of the plan view. And this works very similar to how the elevation works. So it's going to draw this out and any changes that we make to our 3D, um, it's gonna go ahead and update the plan view and any other elevation views that are out there. So you can see that drawing there. And again, if we go into a 3D view, we have just a separate plan view that we can then use on our layouts um, in AutoCAD and plot if we want to. Um, in addition to that new feature, we have made several improvements to our sections. Um, 
The first one is the ability to draw multiple sections um, by selecting a wall. So if you wanted to get a section of this wall here, you had to go through several different clicks of selecting draw product sections and then picking your product and then a spot and kind of do that process over and over again. Um, so what we've done is we've streamlined this by um, allowing you to select the wall. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna draw a line where I wanna create my section. And then I'm gonna use that line as my cutting plane. But when I select my draw product sections, instead of selecting a product, I will select the wall that I want. And we have the ability to um, pick a cutting plane. So I'm gonna use that line that I drew. And then I'm just gonna pick a point in space. So what's gonna happen is that based off wherever that line is, it's gonna find all the products on that wall and go ahead and draw all the uh, products uh, sections right where we selected. So we can see it automatically drew the two sections. So again, just streamlining the process of and reducing the number of clicks that we need in order to uh, create those um, section views. Um, you'll also notice that um, our sections, they have some hatch patterns, um, and this is uh, set up by material. We have now added the ability to allow the user to specify a um, custom hatch pattern. So in order to show this, we'll go into our material file. And for any material that um, is going to be hatched, you can go to, uh, we'll go to our edit screen here and then select our hatching option. So previously we had the ability to set some predefined hatches. Um, so now we've added another option, which is custom. And then you can just enter in the name of the hatch. So if um, the hatch name exists inside of your AutoCAD drawing, any material that uh, is going to be drawn with a section will use the custom hatch pattern that you've specified. So a nice feature there um, to really customize the look of your um, sections. Uh, we also now support multiple sections per product. Um, previously in 15.5, if I was to try to get another section view of my product here, it would lose connectivity to my 3D product and my first section that I drew. So let's go ahead and we'll draw another section of our base. And this time let's select a couple different options. Uh, we're not, not going to use drawing tokens and we'll go ahead and get a section from the right um, side of the product. And we'll just go ahead and pick a point in space where we want to draw that. So we can now see that we have two different sections here. And if we go and make a modification to our uh, main product here, it's no longer going to lose that association. Let's just make this a height of 40 and we'll hit OK. It's going to realize that there are now two sections that need to be updated and automatically um, update those uh, sections with the options that were selected um, previously. So it remembers that this one was drawn to the right without any drawing tokens and it redrew it as such. Um, any black block attributes that are associated with it will also be populated. So if I was to go in here and edit this section uh, symbol and when, if this got redrawn, it would remember those values and populate that as well. So again, just trying to make things easier um, while you're doing your day-to-day -day jobs to not have to remember all the little details when you're going in and trying to fix up your products. All right, so moving on, the next feature I wanna show you guys is the new edit multiple product prompts. Um, in order to show this off, what we have here is um, just a run of cabinets. And this interface has actually been in the program for a while, but it was only accessible if you were inside of the product list here. So what we've done is we've made some improvements to this interface and we have, uh, you, we've now allowed you to um, access it from the drawing. So in order to access this, we'll go to the modify and modify products and we will select the edit multiple product prompts. And then we can select the uh, products that we want to make modifications to. So say if we had a, uh, like I have here, if uh, something came back and we needed to change the toe kick height of all of these products, instead of having to go into each product um, individually and then redraw that, we can now just use the edit multiple product prompts, select the ones we want, and then we will be um, brought up with this interface here. So what this has done is this uh, list here are all of the available prompts from the products that we selected. So just scrolling through here, um, we can see down at the bottom, we have that toe kick height prompt that's available. Um, in order to modify this, we can go ahead and add it to our list here. So here are the three products that we wanna modify. And it's also showing some of their default values. And now for the toe kick height, what we want to do is we're going to go ahead and display the additional prompt values. So we'll go ahead and select that. It's just going to let us know that we're going to populate those values. So now we see each, val each product's toe kick height prompt. So if we want to make a mass edit to these, we can go ahead and highlight the products we want to change. And then we will right click and select the prompt that we want to modify. 
And then we can just enter in new values. So say we needed to change all of these to a six um, inch Tokik height. So now all of those products have been updated with that new Tokik height. Um, in addition to this, if we wanted to, if we're making the change that needs to be displayed in the drawing, when we close down this interface, we can redraw the products that have been modified on close. So we'll go ahead and check that option there and close this down and it's going to go ahead and redraw the products with the new prompt um, information that we have specified. So we'll let this finish up here. So hopefully a pretty handy tool in being able to streamline the process of, um, of being able to make mass edits to your um, drawings and again, saving clicks and reducing and saving time. Um, the last feature I wanna show you is a new token that we have added to our products. And this one isn't as flashy to show. Um, it's actually easier to show you with our help documentation that we've created for it. Um, up on our help site, you can um, look for this right now. Actually, it's uh, live on, the, on our support site and it's called our extended part data token or X part data. And what this will allow you to do is it will allow you to add a token just like you would a machining token to a part in order to populate custom fields. So right now, um, if you wanted some custom information to go into the work order database so you can report off of it, you were really limited to the three part comments that were available. Well, this token extends that. We now have 24 additional custom fields that you can use in order to pass information from the spreadsheet into the work order database. Um, so you'll see here that we have some just generic fields. This is extended data one through 18 and then some system fields that are available. So in order to use this, um, when you add the token, you just specify the name of the field that you want to use. So it's going to be one of these field names and then the value that you want to populate. And then in the spreadsheet, since, um, you know, extended data four doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you're just looking at the spreadsheet, you can add a spreadsheet comment. So you know that, oh, hey, this is, um, this extended data is meant for um, whatever information you want to use it as. So again, a very um, important feature when you need to be able to pass more information to the work order database. So those are things I've got to show, Dominic. I'll pass it back to you. All right, Daniel. Thanks for taking the time to do that. We can see how everybody uh, is going to be able to save time with the flat shot tokens with the 2D drawing improvements that you have. And it's very powerful to be able to edit the prompts of many products at once. And then finally, those X X data part tokens are going to be powerful for people in the enterprise type situation where they have maybe another link ID or a designation for a part type to pass all the way through to that work order database. So we're excited to see how people are going to use these tools uh, and just helping people streamline the way they work. So now we're going to give our attention to Doug. He's going to talk to us about one of the uh, more popular recent modules that we've had implemented our software, the solid modeling tools, the solid model analyzer. Doug, you ready to show us what you got? I'm ready, thanks. So this tour, we're gonna, this time we're gonna take a tour through a candy store. So I thought, yeah, for a kid, a candy store is good, but for woodworkers, maybe it's the tool store, right? So we enjoy tools like kids do candy. So what are the solid modeling tools? Um, now, some of you have used them. For those of you that have not, we refer to the solid modeling tools as SMT, which we could define as a collection of tools that you use to design custom products in a 3D environment. So that's what we give you, the ability to work in 3D. And why? Why do we need 3D tools? What's all the hype about? Well, you've probably heard the saying that the devil is in the detail. And basically what that means is that a task can be more than you first anticipated. That's sometimes true of the design process for custom products. So if you're designing something like a die wall or reception area or an odd shaped cabinet, design flaws in the engineering process can, can come up later in the manufacturing process and slow it down. So 3D design allows the engineer to resolve any potential issues early in the process. And what that means is that uh, a construction pro progresses more efficiently. Um, everyone's happy because the design concept has been communicated with much less uncertainty. So the SMTs from MicroVelmar may be just what you need to create in 3D and work out those bugs 
before production. So you could think of them as powerful tools in your virtual toolbox. So what's new with this release? <clears throat> well, we've got the ability to remove smart layers. So if you look at my screen, I've got some simple die wall products up here. The tree view is populated. And let's go in and look at the man in the smart layers rather. So smart layers <clears throat> are valuable data that Microvelm needs to know about a 3D solid object. So without a smart layer, there's it's really just an AutoCAD object. There's nothing that Microvelm can do with it. But with smart layers, now that object becomes smart. And so with this interface, then previously there was no way to remove extra smart layers from this interface. Now we've given you not only the ability to right click and get the context menu full of, of ways to, to interact with these smart layers, but notably we also give you a way to remove the smart layer. So basically you would click on a layer, you would right click and then remove it if you wanted to remove. So that helps you to keep your list a little list of layers a little bit more manageable. So that's one of the improvements. The other one's a big thing. Uh, many of you have noticed in the past that the stud corner negotiation is not quite what it should be. So we've given this some time and some development. So let's look at our two products here. And if I zoom in and scroll around to our second, or our, our first product rather, you'll see I have a miter type defined for both top and bottom plates and a double stud at each joint. And so the program has accurately placed those double studs on either sides of that miter joint. So that was a little bit sketchy in the past maybe. The other situation here, let me get this to so it shows more clearly. So here I have a top and bottom plate with a butt before corner type and a butt after corner type. So with the one, it placed two studs in conjunction with the top joint. And with the other one, it placed two studs in conjunction with the bottom joint here. So both of those joint types have been improved when it comes to stud corner negotiation. So you'll enjoy looking at that. The next thing we want to look at then is that commands are repeatable in a loop when you're working in SMT. So most of you are probably familiar with what we call AutoCAD recursive commands. So a recursive command is a command that you, you initiate, you perform the work, and then you can restart it just by hitting the enter key. Well, in in SMT, we want to give you something similar. So we don't call them recursive. We call that, we say that these commands are in a repeatable loop. So as, a, as an example of what this can do, let's go over to our extruded tools and let's move a stud. We'll just move it a little ways in this direction to the left. So that stud moved, but notably you'll notice that our our prompt, our command prompt is still in that command. So let's say we wanna move another stud. Well, we can move that stud also. So that's what it means that it doesn't automatically exit the command, that it stays in that command until you, until you exit it. So that can help you save uh, the, the amount of clicking you do, the you know, just it's a time saver, just small little time improvements, but can cumulatively, cumulatively result in greater improvements. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you, let me zoom in here and let's shut the solid modeling tool palette down. And you might think, oh my goodness, we lost all of our manufacturing or design information, but that's not really true because the 3D objects and the construction lines in this drawing are what contain the data. The tree view of the products does not need to retain the data between the sessions because it's, it's in this other location within the 3D objects. 
And in fact, if it did, it would slow down the program. So we don't necessarily want that. So restoring the product is the process of recreating that tree view then so that you could continue working. So here we've got our, our solid model objects saved. We'll draw, redraw the tree view by restoring the objects. We'll open the, the palette first of all. When it opens, there, are no, there is nothing on the tree view. We have to right click and select restore multiple products. And this time I'm going to select window everything. Well, actually, let's go out of that command and zoom over here so I can get everything. And I'll create a crossing window across both these products. And then it works to read the data that's found in those 3D objects and will recreate the tree view. So that means then that now we have everything we need to that we know about these products to continue designing and to create manufacturing data later on down the road. So you did notice then that I, I, I created a, a crossing window to include those both in the selection set. So that's important because uh, there is data in the construction line and the construction line may be a little bit harder to see and to find without hiding parts, but you can, you can easily find it with a, a crossing window selection set. So those are the, the new things, the most notable new things in the solid modeling tools. So let's switch over to the solid modeling analyzer now. So the solid modeling analyzer is separate from the SMT, but used within it, as many of you already know. I like to think of this, uh, this tool, the SMA, solid model anal analyzer, as a virtual black box that analyzes a 3D solid and creates a microvillain product from that solid. So it's pretty amazing. I mean, you can drop in an AutoCAD solid and it spits out a microvillain product. So um, we don't know exactly how it's done, but the developers do, but we just enjoy the results of this. So anyway, several things, three things notably have been improved with the solid model analyzer. First of all, the accuracy for parts with arcs. So what has changed is that previously, when SMA analyzed a solid, solid object containing an arc, sometimes it did not accurately re reproduce the arc. Now that's changed. The arc is accurately reproduced. Also the part length in the corresponding microvellum part and other properties of that part are accurately reproduced. And if you're curious about this, down the road you start using this, you can always verify the accuracy of the arcs if you use the 2D parts editor to check that, the part that results there from the microvellum part that results from analyzation. And you'll see that those two arcs will be the same. So that's been improved and more, more accurate. The second thing then is non-planar parts support. So basically planar parts are parts in which all the vertices are in the same plane. And an easy way to say that is they're flat parts basically, right? So non-planar parts can be one of several different types. They can be cylindrical, they can be conical, or they can contain compound curves. So I've created a little graphic that illustrates that fact. So here it shows that our non-planar parts will support segments of a cylindrical arc. It will support segments of a conical arc, but it will not support parts of a compound curve. And there are technical reasons for that, but um, these are the two that you will use, the, the cylindrical and the conical. So, the beta version um, is available, the beta version of this non-planar support is available for cylindrical and conical segments in version 15.6. So you'll want to check that out because if you haven't had that ability in the past, this will expand your, your use of the, the solid model analyzer and what it can do. Now the third thing, save the best for last, and this is a big deal this is improved speed of analyzation. 
with metric configurations. So for all of our users in Australia, New Zealand, other countries that primarily work in metric, this is a, a huge thing. So, so previously, we added analyzation algorithms to SMA that were based on a C++ API. So as a result, we were pretty happy with the results from those program changes. They, um, they resulted in extraordinary speed improvements in analyzation time of solids. So that was great. The problem was the benefit was only see when work, seen when working with imperial data. Metric configurations did not take full advantage of the improvements. Well, that has changed, I'm happy to announce. And the metric data data analyzation is also now significantly faster. And by significantly in our tests, it was 80% faster when analyzing large arcs. So pretty impressive speed boost for metric data. So we don't have a lot of earth shaking changes with SMA, but several improvements to what it does, especially to how fast it does it and the accuracy of the results. So go ahead and check it out in version 15.6. All right, Doug, thanks for showing us some of the stuff that's new with Solid Model Analyzer. We know that all together it's uh, become a lot more stable, a lot more reliable, and we'll see that will prove true for everybody out in the field. Uh, but there's a question that has continued to come up during the course of this live event here and people want to know when is this available and what for. So I'll tell you now, this 15.6 update is available for both AutoCAD OEM and standard for the years 2017, 18, and 19. We're going to continue as we move forward to be compatible with the last three years, just like Autodesk. Uh, everyone that has access to this release will be those who are current on support. They're, they will automatically be notified that an update is available. The button on your splash screen when you fire up Toolbox will change. It will glow and tell you that an update is available. So when is that going to be, be available? The United States West Coast is going to receive that update during the first week of July. The United States East Coast is going to receive that the second week of July. And then finally, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada will be notified of that update availability on the third week of July. So we encourage you to keep an eye out for that. Go ahead and uh, download that update and start working with it in your sandbox environment. And uh, we hope to hear a lot of positive feedback from uh, your tests and actual implementation into production environments. Now we're going to give our attention to Jessica as we wrap things up. She is going to update us on what is happening next in the microvellum community. Jessica? Um, we do have some exciting things coming up. Um, first, in just a few days, we have OISA at the Sydney Exhibition Center. In fact, um, David, you, that you heard earlier, takes off, I think, in about an hour or so to head over. So we're looking forward to that event. And we'll be at booth 1621. So if you guys are going to be at that show, do stop by and say hi. We'd love to see you and, and catch up. Uh, then later um, this August, we'll be attending IWF. And we'll be there August 22nd to the 25th. A lot of you are familiar with that show. And I know that, like us, you're eagerly anticipating the show. And we look forward to showing you some of the exciting things that we'll be demonstrating and how they can help you streamline your shop's processes. Um, then for us, we also want to announce the Microvellum Campus. Um, at TechCon, we had an overwhelming request for education opportunities for the users. And so what we are going to bring is this um, Microvellum Campus opportunity. The first class will be on our solid modeling tools. And we're going to do this class online so that we can give you this deep dive training. But instead of having it all in one day, we're going to have it over a period of two weeks in four smaller, easy to digest classes. And then at the end, we'll also have certification opportunities available. So that is of a, a good interest to many. 
and we will be releasing more information about this and the links for registration um, tomorrow at the conclusion of this event. Um, so um, that's all I have for you events. So back to you. All right. Appreciate it, Jessica. We really encourage everyone listening to regularly visit that page, microbiome.com slash events. There's always something new coming up, probably even in your geographic area. You could attend and work with techs and get the benefit of that training, or you can do the online virtual training as well. Uh, so to conclude things, you'll notice that a survey is going to pop up and ask you a few questions about how you enjoyed today's webinar. We hope you take a second to fill that out. And all together, we encourage you, please keep up to date with the microbiome community contribute to uh, the betterment of this software and the woodworking industry by participating on our forums, attending all the live events available, the shows, drop by and see us. So we appreciate you taking time out of your, bu your busy schedules to visit. Uh, and we will see you uh, at a show or at an event soon.